conducting town business using remote participation via Zoom. We ask those of you not recognized by the chair or otherwise engaging the discussion of the moment to please mute your microphone to avoid interruptions outside the conversation. Uh, the select board meetings can be viewed by going into the cable videos icon for the home page of the town's web. We have only one item on the agenda and Kevin, an update for you. I know that you had intended to discuss the balanced budget uh, thing that you did with the FinCom, uh, but given the tightness of the meeting, uh, what, I, uh, have su uh, what I'm suggesting now right at the top, let's just uh, move over that right now. Uh, and if anyone wants to get details, they're welcome to contact uh, Kevin directly and he can take you through what uh, he presented to the FinCom uh, the other night. And we can dive right into these warrants. Sounds good. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, when we I'm just, when we hit Article Three, I'll just touch on it very two sentences about the the balancing efforts or a few sentences. But for today, and knowing we're we're a little bit um, short on time, but it's it's important that we keep the ball rolling with the articles. Uh, the hope is to go through um, the articles. We we provided a version two point one to the board um, a little more than a week ago, received feedback from the select board. Also received uh, additional comments from KP Law um, on the document, uh, specifically around the zoning articles. Um, I know there was some work done by uh, the planning board and, um, and Ms. Bermudez to try to make sure that language reconciled with the planning's, uh, planning board's expectations for it as well. So. The version that is on that was sent out yesterday and it's on board docs um, incorporates the, the edits we received, comments we received, um, and is a version 2.2. So just from version control purposes, 2.1, this is now 2.2 to incorporate it. The hope is after we go through today, we'll be to provide a version 3.1 or 3.0, uh, which will incorporate any additional comment comments or um, maybe uh, decisions made by the board today or direction given by the board today um, so that we can keep that moving. That will then go to the, both today or tomorrow to the um, finance committee, but also to the select board and the finance committee will be taking up the articles um, on Monday at their regular meeting. So, uh, which starts at 6 PM. We also have a meeting at 7 PM. So there'll be, it'll be the first hour that we probably talk mostly about these, the uh, Warren articles themselves. So, uh, Kevin, are we, uh, can you just tell us where we are in the schedule? We're on schedule or you're going to head of schedule. Is that correct? Yeah. So typically with the, there's two major components to the schedule at this point. It's the budget balancing and it's the warrant. Relation, relation to balancing the budget, we're ahead of schedule. Um, that's what we talked about at the top, Ms. Mr. Chair, that you mentioned, which is that we have identified pretty clearly what our target number is ahead of schedule because of the overrides at the two schools. We know what our number is. We don't, we're not going to, we're not going to be able to absorb those large numbers into our, our levy. And so with that, knowing what the guidelines were, we can back into what our number is. And so um, from a budgetary standpoint, we are as of Monday, significantly ahead of schedule. Usually we're, we're about a month ahead. As for the warrant um, and the, and where we are right now, it being the first of, uh, of, of March, um, the idea is that we have comments and that um, we can send it, those additional comments over to KP um, for Friday of next week. So we have a little bit more time to kind of work on that between now and, and then. And then the idea is to have that back um, from KP. FinCom will review the Warren articles vote we'll vote them they'll vote them and then they'll be incorporated into the final version at that point that goes to press uh at the very end of this month march so we're about 30 days out 29 days out from having to have a completed 100 percent wrapped up document so kevin the, everything has to be done by march 31st all verbiage everything done for the warrants is that also the case for um the budget Yes, because Article 3 within the uh, uh, warrant will be the, the budget article. So although the budget's as big of a conversation as the warrant itself, that all that si the, the path of the budget gets synthesized down to Article 3. So that's where, okay. yeah. That's fine. And so when does it actually go to print? When do we release it to go to print? 
Friday the 31st is, is when we'll be taking it to um, Middleton for printing. Take to Middleton. So we have to have it cleaned up before the 31st because you're walking it over on the 31st. Okay. And then um, it's mailed out when? So um, the, I'll back into the, maybe that date. So the final distribution, of, distribution of the final warrant uh, to select board and FinCom will be on the 23rd, Thursday, the 23rd. That's incorporating FinCom's votes, select board's agreement with all of the language. And then it's, and this gives us a little bit of time to finalize any last tweaks to the language. And then we put it to press on the 31st. It then gets picked up at the printer on the 10th of April, Monday, the 10th. And the residents are mailed them on Tuesday, the 11th. Um, and um, the warrants posted to the town website that day as well. Okay, super. Thank you. Well, um, if, if, if we're good, Mr. Chairman, I can start kind of, go, we can go through yep. uh, the latest version of the document. And I think if it's okay for the, this being a work session, and this is sort of a pivotal meeting in the sense that we can kind of get into some of these articles more than we have, and both for, for the actual article and it's, it being on the warrant and the second, you know, how we're positioning it. Um, we have some grammar corrections that was provided by Mr. Brown, um, comments by Ms. Bermudez, um, and I mentioned KP Law provided. So again, anything highlighted in yellow still needs to be um, updated and, and taken out. That last yellow section, and if we go right to article second, um, where the yellow is, that's where you'll see the changes. Those um, are gonna be coming out because we know we're not using ARPA this year. We weren't planning on it, but now we know definitively because we have a path forward to balance. So those numbers will be coming out um, as well. Um, actually, they have been, sorry, they have been taken out. They're just showing as the red line of being taken out in the document. Um, what we have done on this article, article two, is you'll notice that there's the conservation commission um, amount of 15,000 being put into Article Three, um, through Article Two, uh, to offset those op general operating costs. Those are the fees that are raised during the course of the year. Uh, Conservation Commission, we cover their expenses for their salary and wages. Um, and when they raise funds, those those funds come back to us through their their process as an offset to the budget for for conservation. So that's that's what we're looking at. It's fifteen. I did have a chance to talk with Heidi Gaffney and she's she's comfortable with that and we're confirming it with um, Catherine Gabriel as well um, you'll notice in there one of the things we did is we split out um, the revolving account uh, typically we asked for last year we had 25,000 we're at 20 this year um, and then 25,000 for perpetual care and then this year we're adding in their cemetery lot of uh, sale lots account for 5,000 the culmination that's fifty thousand dollars. That's the outsourcing for the cemetery maintenance, the, the mowing. Um, we did that last year. Um, the only difference is we we reduced the revolving account by five, and we backfilled it with the sale of lots. Um, and then pegs in there as well at the fifty four eight ninety eight, uh, which is and all contract. of that. Kevin is is legal taking from each of those funds to yep. to outsource. That's all cleared. That was in last year. We worked through the process with KP, um, and it's it's clear this year as well. But the sale of lots, that's new? It doesn't actually sell lots. Um, so we, it, it's in, we have three sources of revenue that we, three funds that we collect revenue at the cemetery. It's okay. perpetual care. It's a sale of lots. And it's a revolving account. And so that, this year, we're just spreading the wealth a little bit, spreading it out just a little bit more, putting the 5000 out of the sale of lots, which allows us to have a little bit more cushion under the revolving account instead of maxing it up at 25, which is the most that we can take out annually out of the revolving. We're only taking 20. So if there's incidental, <clears throat> excuse me, incidental cost at the cemetery, we'll have a mechanism for those to get covered for costs um, through that uh, revolving account. Okay. So those, what we're taking out for those three accounts, those are all from interest is that correct in these funds um, or in some of them, maybe the perpetual care and revolving, maybe just so perpetual revol care. I know it, one of them, we can yeah. only take interest. We can't dip into the principal. Is that correct? So it's, it's so on the revol perpetual care fund is interest bearing account. The other two are not. 
Um, and in this case, I think our interest, I don't have it in front of me at the moment, Madam Vice Chair, but I know our, we, we put the 25 in last year. It was based on the interest that we typically earn. Um, it doesn't. Okay, so we're not dipping into principal. It's not the attempt. It's, it has not been the attempt to use principal to, to offset that cost. Um, well, it, intent is one thing. And then what we're actually doing is another. Is this dipping into principal or is this strictly interest? It's not. Well, it's it's difficult to tell because we have enough interest. But if you look at it from an annual interest bearing, I guess it depends on the question. <laughs> Sorry. We have earned interest every year and we earn more interest typically than that twenty five thousand that we're taking out. But if for, in a given year, the interest that we earn is less than the 25, the remaining interest that's in that account would be the first that would be used if it's available. The reason I bring it up, because I remember, and I don't know if it's still in here, we had a warrant that, or an article that we approved previously for I think 160,000 and then for 40,000. And then yep. we were looking to undo that because we used ARPA instead. And mm -hmm. so is that still in here? As of right now, for discussion, it is. I know we had discussions okay. that we're waiting a year to take it and reapply it just to see what happens at the cemetery for cost. Because if okay. we could use the ARPA, but that, that's a My further understanding discussion. is that the 40,000 was not covered by ARPA, only the 160. Is that correct? No, um, the 40,000, which was for the water mains, was ARPA covered. It did get covered by that. The all 200,000 was covered by ARPA? Everything at the cemetery, which is two pieces of the project. One was to put the water mains, the water lines in, replace those lines, and then extend those lines to the new section. And then second phase is to then pave it. Um, those were those were both those one has been completed. That's the water line. Those have been paid for through ARPA instead of the prior Warren article. And the next one is the road paving, which we anticipate using ARPA um, to cover the cost, in which we talked with Superintendent Wilds, I think last week or the week before I asked them when we finished up the water with the money left, would that be sufficient to stay within the budget that was initially outlined last year, regardless of funding mechanism, but what the budget is? And he said, yes, as of right now, with rates on paving, we should be able to cover from a budgetary standpoint, the entirety of the, of the project without going over budget. Again, we're using ARPA now instead of cemetery monies, but we're still okay. I just the reason I raise it is that after looking into it a little bit, and I learned that we are only supposed to use interest. Last year, we used a lot more than interest when we did that article. We must have dipped into principal to pull out so, that side the, of money. Well, I know we talked. I uh, I have to go back and I might have to because of time. I would probably want to table that question and come back to you, Madam Vice Chair, only because um, I know we spent a lot of time on the nuance of that account with KP and doing it the right way. So I know that we didn't violate any type of how the account's set up because we, it was a very nuanced, we were for the first time utilizing the, those funds in the cemetery. So I, I'd have to look back at my notes on that to be 100% okay. sure. And I, I ask because we are the cemetery commissioners now and we should know, I should know, you know, and, and I'm a little late in, in coming to this realization and getting on top of them. But as the commissioners, we should understand how those accounts operate, what the dollar values are, what they're being spent on. So um, maybe not now, but a little later, we can kind of delve into that so that we understand now that there are no, uh, there are no cemetery commissioners anymore. Um, we are they, unless this warrant changes it. I just started to read something about moving the cemetery commissioners again to other people. Um, so we might want to have a discussion on that, the whole issue of the cemetery commissioners. Do you want to wait till we get to that article? Because I know that's something. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be fine. So generally what I hear synthesizing it down is you're looking for a, an update or an explanation on how the cemetery, different funds work and how we're applying those funds. Okay. Exactly. Easy enough. That'd be great. Um, all right. So we, any other questions on article two? Again, it's the same as last year <laughs> that we were using the sale of lots and we're taking out the ARPA. Um, article three. Um, 
So what we have in Article 3 is where the actual override lies. It's in the motion. And that's how it was done in 2019, the last time it was done. It's, and what we have is, as mentioned at the top, we've, we have a path forward um, on balancing, which makes up 100 and roughly 120,000 of base budget cuts this year. Um, and about 125,000 in over ask cuts. Um, and that's off of version two. We already made cuts in version one um, to get us to balance. There's also some levers on the model that help us get there as well. Tac um, the um, snow and ice, for instance, um, the overlay, different items. Does that, that relate to this one, Kevin? Does it those things that you just did, did this change any of the wording in this article? It did not, but I know there was, this is sort of the place to talk about it within the agenda for today is, is the balancing within Article 3. So that's why I'm sort of touching it. And I know it was yeah, a question. I, I agree with Marshall and putting that off just because we have to get through 46 articles today. So no, that's maybe. all I was going to say to it, just touching on it, that that's, that's we got to balance, which is, the, which is the ultimate goal of Article 3, right? We have to make sure we get to balance. Unless Can I just ask you, like from an administrative perspective, if, since both the regular budget and the override are in this one question, yep. what if for some reason at town meeting, people don't agree to the override? Does someone just amend the motion to pull out the override component and just pass the base budget? <clears throat> I've never worked on an override and the mechanics of how that would work, but I presume that is correct, that the motion would change so that the, well, I think what they would do is they'd first vote in its entirety, if it is in fact recommended by the uh, FinCom, the motion as read, if it's not does not pass, someone would then have to mo probably motion for that to be revised without the override, so that we can pass the budget, the base budget. Um, but I, 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 as we get closer, and in, in Lauren and Matt are involved, mechanically speaking, they'll they'll speak to it. But the language has been reviewed by KP, and and so. Um, yeah. It looks it, the same as previous overrides. Yeah. If you look back to the previous warrant. So, so, so I understand that Kevin. So we would at the end of the meeting where the questions are, we would come back and take a second vote on the two and a half or the, no. it's, it's here and it's done at that point. This is our piece. The last page just sort of, it's to show what the election two days later would look like. So there won't be action on that last page. The action for the town meeting will be article three. Okay, thank you. Got it. Yep. Um, still need, uh, we're going to, we have on an upcoming um, agenda to have the water budget approved. The, we have the numbers now that we've done what the increase is for all the non union personnel. We also have 167000 for indirect costs that the water department will pay back to the town. We have all that information now. So those numbers will get plugged into version three. Um, Right now, it's just the timing, the, the timing of this meeting and the timing of, um, excuse me for just one second. I apologize. And then at um, one of our meetings, Marshall, we'll need to vote to approve the water department yep. budget. Yep. Feel free to talk amongst yourselves. Apologies. Um, I'd have to leave early on this meeting myself, depending. I'm awaiting another call back. But um, in regards to um, the water, that just needs to be plug and play like prior years as well. And that's the same language we use year over year. Um, mask and omit, same thing, override. Um, and we are waiting to fi finalize what their number is. Uh, that number has moved down since the first time they presented the budget due to state aid, but also in addition to that, they are looking at other further reductions. So that number is still blank. Um, so Kevin, just from a, um, refresh my memory, um, the regular base budget needs two thirds of the town um, towns to vote yes. So two of the three have to vote yes on the base budget. Mm -hmm. Is it that way with the override as well? Yes. So whatever their number that they're appropriating. Or is it all three towns for the override? So it's it's two thirds of their budget. So basically, however they present it, whether it's based, but whether we were able to do it within without an override or if 
there's an override. There, it's but each specifically with the override. I'm specifically yep. speaking. If they need an override, do all three towns have to approve it, or just two out of three? Two out of three have to approve their base budget, which includes the override for each of those. The base cities. budget does not, though, include the override. The override it, has to be voted it, on. It, so right. technically it does because we receive their appropriation, whether it meets guidelines or not, that's their number. And then each community votes on that and each community makes their decision on whether they want the over guidelines, whatever each individual community lays out as guidelines to be an override, or if they want to build it into their budget, into their budget using the existing tax levy. For instance, Middleton is baking the, their number, the over guidelines amount into their base budget. Whereas Boxford and Topsfield are going to be using calling it an override above the guidelines. So because it's a regional school district, they give us a number. And then basically it could be a 10% increase, it could be a 1% increase, whatever their number is. And then it's dependent on each community if they call it an override or not. But you're really voting on their budget that they're providing to us. And then we're making that distinction that this is an override. Um, and so Met, because Middleton's baking it in, the only way in this case that um, they will not be successful, they being mass economic would not be successful in the full appropriation that they're requesting is if both Boxford and Topsfield vote against it. If either one of those two communities, vote, if it either is one third for the override portion, that it, 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 yes, okay. In a, yes, okay. Um, any other comments or questions on Article 5 at this point? Discussion? So the 382 right now, you expect a lot of movement on that number. You have just no idea what, what that number is going to do? I think it's going to drop by at least 100,000 based on state aid numbers that came in. Or a quarter, week. okay. And then I know they're looking at base budget. It, they don't report until the 15th um, what their final budget number is of March, but okay. We'll know whatever that number ends up being. We'll just will be the number we plug above their base that our base that we created for them above that two and a quarter percent that we gave. Anything above that, whether it's 300, 200, 100, that's the number we'll plug in. Thank you. And that's for the base. Then there's another number for the additional. Do we know what the additional is? Whatever that override is above two and a, two and a quarter percent that we gave them. I don't Do think we know what that number is? So basically, their number is with two and a quarter percent year over year. Their total number that they're spending the three communities is 38,367,132. Based on enrollment shifts and based on a two and a quarter percent increase on their budget, which was the guidelines provided by the FinCom Tomasco, they can raise their budget assessment at the top field up to 8,990,477. The over amount that they're at beyond that in what they've provided us in our proration because the real numbers in the 9 million 200 something 300 something number that difference is what the override for tops will be and then that number can come down based on state aid which we just received which was positive and further adjustments that the school committee makes in the operating budget with dr harvey and then that so that number is anything above two and a quarter percent, that, that's what that override number will represent. Okay, so roughly, if someone said to you, Kevin, right now you have to put something on the ballot, what number is going on the ballot is the two and a half percent override? Right now, after? right now, the last verbal, I haven't received anything writing, but verbally from one of the school community members is that it's around $270,000. 270, okay, thanks. Yeah, no problem. And sorry, it is kind of nuanced and a little bit confusing because of how we provide guidelines and then they give us a number okay. and then we got to get a card. Rest. You needed to know if it was bigger than bread basket, you know, because that's a lot lower than the number we were first hearing. So. Yeah. And that's that's directly derived from the state aid number being higher than they expected as well. OK, thank you. Welcome. All right. Um, North Shore Agricultural and Technical School District. So we are holding in the model, the FinCom model, which is the tool we use to balance the budget, about a 10% increase um, from last year. We know our enrollment went up too. 
We did hear word yesterday. It's nowhere in writing that the budget's increasing 5.6%. Now we have a higher, potentially a higher proration with the enrollment, but that's based on the entire enrollment. Not comfortable yet making any adjustments to this until we get receive something from the superintendent and the school um, regarding what the number is. But um, that was something of, of a good smoke signal to us that we might be better than what we've put in the model, which is good. But it's very possible too with some of the um, staffing increased costs that um, it could be closer to the number that we put in there or potentially even higher. But I will know in the coming days where that yeah, number is. It is what it is, right? So there's nothing we mm -hmm. need to discuss. Okay. That's right. We plug and play on that. And that comes right off the, the general levy. And then the consent agenda, um, can probably all the same as last year. Uh, until we have, I have a hundred thousand in there for compensated absence of fund. We'll finalize that number for the next version as well, which is uh, the 11th art, article 11, article 12, same thing. We have 80 in there. That's last year's number. We're confirming what that number will be. Um, and then the police fire special demi leave fund um, that was established like the prior two articles were established to have a fund where we can pay out certain things that are sort of one-time costs that the town incurs uh, relates very specific things that um, <clears throat> uh, from an operation standpoint, in this case, we've, we've drawn down on the indemnity leave fund because of um, the cost for um, one of our police officers been on long-term disability. Um, so we're looking to replenish that and we have a placeholder 20 K in there, but that that's subject to change as well. And then you'll notice on article 14, that is really the only change from the last version you saw where we went from 25,000 up to 30. And the reason for that is 5,000 out of the uh, over guideline request from Chief Hubby and the police department for the roof maintenance. If you remember, there was a $250,000 roof capital item. We talked yeah, to we talked about that the last time. So we, yeah. that's why that number is reflected with that. Um, Kevin, quick question on this one. Is this an account that can store up money from year to year? Or does this have to flow back anything that's not used to free cash? It does store, it does go into a bank, but typically that money is not available to us after. It, we usually spend the vast majority, if not all the money, uh, the last few years. Okay, so it's, it's down close to zero, or we project it will be by the time this new budget goes in? Yeah, I think right now, yes. I think that we, the, historically speaking, the last two full fiscal years, we've spent the basically the entirety of those of the funds to 25,000 year over year. Um, things like work at the library. Um, we've used some of the money yeah. to help with the elevators and things like that. So that's a what, little what about fund. water? Sorry. Oh, go ahead. Ken. That's okay. Uh, water damage to town hall. I mean, if insurance hadn't covered it all, would it come from here as well as a sort of a, a weird emergency? Okay. And we actually, we will probably pay out of this account. I, I, we were talking about how we're going to actually, because we're being reimbursed by the insurance company. So we actually have to pay for and the first, cost. Right, right. So we're seeing if we're going to, we're talking about, do we have enough money in this account? Because we use it typically to front the cost so that we can pay for it out of an account. And if this is the right place or if we find a different mechanism to do that. But um, that that's absolutely right, Mr. Brown. That would be where we would, one of the places that we are looking for the insurance, whether it be reimbursed or not, this would be an account that could help with that. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, and then police cruisers. Um, we've talked about yeah, that. A couple I don't... questions on that, Kevin. Um, yes. It doesn't have any trade-ins here. So it just looks like we're growing the fleet. We have not typically put in the detail any or any offset in the trade-ins for the police cruisers. And we had, I think we had that discussion last year and, and Chief spoke to it. And the reason for that is that the, the, because the vehicles have such high mileage on them, um, when we do put them for disposition in the past, we receive limited amount of money back under a thousand dollars in many cases. Um, so there's not really a true offset on the trading value because we do run them very much deep into their useful life. Um, and the other- in as bad shape as Chief was saying that he considers them unsafe and they need to get the two new cars. I think we should be, stating to the residents that we're not hanging on to these cars because anytime you hang on to a car there's cost associated with that if it's truly not safe and they shouldn't be using it 
we should be getting rid of it. So it's not on insurance. We don't store it. We don't use it if it's unsafe. So the COA has made a request for a pool car. We had had some conversation last year about a pool car for town hall. And one I of remember the, that. Yeah, the intent is, in, in, is that whichever vehicle comes offline, we would assess it and see if, if it's able to be used for that pool car purposes going forward. Um, rather than purchasing a new one, the, the type of use that a, a town hall slash COA pool car would have, I think would be different than the use of in the wear and tear you see on a daily basis when it's being used for would police be. department. Like, my question is, we've got two new police cruisers. Mm -hmm. And so we've had some talk about one of those cars going to town hall. What happens to the other one? Or are we just increasing the fleet? Um, I would probably defer to Chief Hubby to give you a, a very good detailed well, of even what it, it has to be in the article. So we have to say what's happening. Either we're, either we're growing the fleet or we're replacing the cars and, and holding steady. We can certainly add that. Again, prior years, we haven't necessarily, but that's okay. We could certainly provide better clarity. I think the only concern I would have, and it's not something we could we certainly overcome it, is we don't know for certain exactly what we would do with that because it doesn't hold a lot of value from a resale it holds probably more value from pool car purposes, but it might not be suited for pool car purposes when we do decommission okay, There's it. the so pool car, and then there's a second car because we're adding two police cruisers. So if one of those goes to the town hall, there's still another one. And what's happening to that one that apparently is not safe anymore and shouldn't be used by the police. So why aren't we getting rid of it? it just Or is it just staying on the fleet? I mean, I know we had this up a couple months ago in the capital conversation, I, I wouldn't want to misinform right. the board right now. Um, I'd have to go back to my notes again to, to look at exactly what that second vehicle is, what the chief's idea is, or if it's a, if that vehicle in, would replace a, a backup vehicle that's past mm -hmm. its useful life. I'm, I'm not certain. I'd have to double check with the chief on that second vehicle. Because we have grown the fleet quite a bit. And so I think the question is going to come up. Um, and in every other case, we do trade-ins. And anytime we get a vehicle, we trade it. We put on here, just as Gary did, we're buying for something for 53,000, we're trading in the net cost. So people know we're actually getting rid of one and, and getting another one. This just looks like we're growing. So I think it'd be important for Chief to address what's happening to the other car. And the other thing is um, it says here, it's anticipated that we'll do Chevy Tahoes. Do we not know? Are we going to the town without saying for sure we are buying two Chevy Tahoes? Well, I mean, it's it's pretty. Do we need to? I mean, yeah, it no. wasn't this the whole thing last year too? I remember listening to your yeah. board calls. Is we're giving him the ability to buy a car, not dictating which cars he purchases. We didn't right? dictate. He's the one who did a full presentation on it. But then it sounds wishy in here. It's like, uh, well, it's anticipated we're going to. Thief came and made the case. To buy yeah. two Chevy yeah. Tahoes. Yeah, so, but it Gary's doesn't, not, the way it's worded doesn't tie his hands. No, but I mean, everything else, every other vehicle we're buying, it, we specify what we're buying. It doesn't say it's anticipated that we'll buy this particular dump truck or it's anticipated. Oh, we, this is the only we, one where it's kind of, well, are you or aren't you? Because we previously had SUVs. We got an electric car. We're now saying Chevy Tahoes. I think the town will want to know what it is he's planning on buying. So yeah, but do we want to create a warrant that ties his hands to that? I do not. I don't either. And I thought, and we, I I thought we agreed we weren't. Uh, yeah, I think it's different with like a you know a DPW dump truck. There's not a range of those generally available. It's a particular model. There are there is a range of police cars available. And given and he things did an like, extensive presentation and said that I, was his recommendation, even against I, some of the board's comments. So I'm I just wondering that, why it's anticipated. I understand that, but also there are incredible demands and timelines and supply chain issues that could come up. And if when this finally passes and the money comes through, Chevy Tahoes aren't available, if we have limited him in an article that says it will be Chevy Tahoe's. Now we will run the risk of having no police cars. Well, maybe he can just speak to that then that it's, you know, every intention after a thorough analysis, but if for some reason, as you said, that the supply is limited or he just can't get them, then he's going to have to 
to shift, but just to let people know, he did extensive analysis. So I wouldn't want people to think, you know, yeah, we're thinking this, but we might do something else. So he did a lot of work on it. He could speak to it. I mean, we, we could easily change it. Like after extensive analysis, the preferences or we are trying to, or something well, I mean, like it that. It says that, but if you want to add the analysis piece, I think, you know, that's fine, but I don't want to lock, lock it in as black and white, hard and fast. Now at, at the same time, he can't take the money and buy like a Tesla Roadster or something, Very right? Good. Not sure. without okay. not without the approval of the select board. Because again, but, I mean, when the actual purchase happens, it comes back to us. Ah, uh, okay. Thank you. It does. But then we take the same stance, which is he's done extensive research, let him run his department. So it could be something else. But it, it just sounded yep. no trade in and then the anticipated, it sounded weaker than actually the case he made. He made a very strong case, but this looks a little loose to me. But if he speaks to it. And I see Lynn's. I see Lynn's point. There's no problem put, putting that information in there. I think the only thing on the because we do go back to the italicized language in the in the motion itself, right? The, and um, you know, I think to to Mr. Hook and Mr. McDonald's points, you know, we want to provide as much clarity on what we are doing and what we want to do, without you know, if Tahoe discontinue their their stock and it's going to take five years to purchase one we're going to have to flex. Right. And so we're trying to put, you know, we have had the explorers, we bought the EV and now this adds to it and it's anticipated. We've done the research behind this, the language in the document to say, this is where we're trying to go to. I just, it's, it's just echoing what was said earlier. I think it's really important for chief from an operational standpoint that this doesn't vary from anything we've said. It just allows us in the event, something changes that we can have enough flexibility to, to, to do what we need to, but it's a, at this point, chief's locked in. It, it would be something outside our control if something other than a Tahoe was purchased, likely. Yeah, maybe then just to speak to it, because it looks like we've gone from SUV to an electric, and now we're thinking Chevy, that people might be saying, what are you guys doing? You know, do you know what you're doing? Um, uh, radios, so on the radios, that's, again, that's the last year of the continual um, uh, replacement schedule that we've had for the last three or four years. Um, I don't know if there's any comments, questions, issues with the language. No, nope, looks good. Mm -hmm. uh, fire department ambulance. And this actually came up at the end of the FinCom meeting the other night. It was built into the model of 100%, the 500,000 being uh, free cash allocation. It's not. Um, it's it's using ARPA money. It's, it's the stabilization, capital stabilization, and it's the ambulance stabilization with a piece of free cash. However, Chief's getting me a better number. Uh, the 500 was a very conservative estimate. Uh, we talked a couple of weeks ago. Um, when this comes out, I will have an updated number, but it's, it's very, very, very likely to come down. Not, it should not go up um, what that number is going to be. Um, so stay in the tuned. Event it, Kevin, in the event it does go up, is that an ARPA allocation that you earmark for that or, or not? So we'd have to look at every, all the different levers that we have. Um, I would probably very much try to avoid free cash because um, I think it's better served in a different to use different funding source to cover any ad additional costs if we can. And ARPA probably would be the first place to look to. Yep. Um, my intention on this is actually, if the cost comes down, is to eliminate the free cash component first and use the grants and other stabilization funds um, as the mechanism to make the purchase. Um, Kevin, the wording in here says that we'll have three ambulances. So um, I would prefer to change the language. I don't think we need three ambulances. We never really had a full discussion and vote on it. So I'll, I want, I'd really like to have Chief speak to that because, um, you know, that's a very much a department operational um, request that she's making to keep the third ambulance. Um, I see that just from my seat, she's made good points to it um, to when we've gone through the conversations on the need and it's really spurred from when one of our two went down and having to find a third, a second vehicle to back up the primary. Um, there was a lot of efforts to identify that third vehicle. Um, we had a couple communities, Newberry was one of them. I think Lynn was another community where we were able to get their ambulance on, but then when they needed it back, we had to decommission it again, give it back. They, 
recommission a new re, new ambulance. So to all that said, um, maybe before we make the final decision on that, knowing that this is something that the board would like to discuss further, I, at the next work session, I can bring Chief in to, to speak to it specifically. That'd be great. Thank you. And and the last sentence, I think these are, are, are Cam's comments, but just based on what we were talking about, the police cruisers, this is even less clear what we're going to do with that third one. But that'll get settled then at the next work session. Yes, I'll make sure Chief's there. And then we can make the call. <laughs> um, public works dump truck. Looking for a better number on Gary as well, similar to the conversation with the ambulance, tighten that number up. Um, problem with the vehicles though, it's such a, the lead times and, and the estimates are hard to really nail down to the number, to where we'd like them. The costs are so variable now, relatively speaking to prior years that we even, we felt that pain with the last year's pickup in, in uh, dump truck that was purchased because it, it took the lead time on it was so long from May to July, and a little time beyond that it took that the cost went up significantly um, on us. So I want to work with Gary not to, I want to make sure we have a, a good number in there that allows us to be able to purchase it with a little bit of a contingency built in there because we've now experienced that a couple of years in a row where um, costs have gone up because we try to get that number as tight as possible. So, but that's just a heads up on, on sort of how we're thinking about the number. Um, and but Kevin, we Want to put that two hundred thousand in in um, yellow as well, uh, because two hundred thousand minus eight is one hundred and ninety two thousand. So that's a number that needs to change too. If I think all it is three of them actually. I, no, I think it, I, I, it might be because they've been highlighted for comment. Because I believe that that should be highlighted. If I, that's my recollection, but if I missed yeah, that, there's, I, there's a comment from Cam there to that. There's a, there's that a comment and it's in gray, but it's still reading two hundred thousand. So. Right. I'm just I, from the. You're absolutely right, Madam Vice Chair. It should be yellow. I'm just wondering if I don't have the document up on my screen right the second, but I'm wondering if it's because the comment changed the color of the of the of that item. But either way, I'll double check that. Oh, okay. It is. It is not because of that. It's not. It's not that. Okay. All right, and then um, this one's an interesting one. Um, so we had this exact article last year for the zero two <laughs> mower, and we had it approved, and then we used ARPA money to buy a mower. So this article still exists in the funding associated with the 10,000 that was appropriated. So what KP, when Matt looked at this, what Matt ended up doing was he added $2,000 to the request the couple with the other articles so that we could have the full 12,000 we were looking for for that replacement of the zero turn mower. Um, in theory, it doesn't necessarily have to be in there because we used again, the ARPA money to pay for a mower last year. We saw the article from last year. We could skip this year in allocating, in allocating more funds and have another warrant article if the board so chooses. But from a transparency standpoint, that's why this is in here as it is as sort of a placeholder like to get rid of as many articles as possible if it's not necessary and mm -hmm. I would say pull it okay just does Gary definitely need this I know that we've had you know we outsourced um the cemetery and um we got another vehicle that does mowing and my understanding is we only have two people who mow but we have four mowers so, so are they we, back up so yeah so we have four four mowers um, what ends up happening is that um, we've got three people in Park and Cemetery um, that would be here if everybody were fully staffed, which we're fortunately, we have two people who just accepted the positions to the recently retired position, the existing open position. So we'll be fully staffed come the spring. Um, and then in addition to that, many a times we are pulling someone from highway. Uh, Andrew Donnell does it quite often, actually, when needed. He's kind of the first to raise his hand. He'll jump on the zero, the extra zero turn and, and help us if we need to catch up on some fields before a ball game or if there's something that um, just from the regular schedule needs to get addressed. Um, so what Gary spoke to us at FinCom, I, we were in our meeting Monday, but I know Gary and I debriefed afterwards. He said he, this question came up. And the reality is, is that we aren't just going to purchase to purchase. If there's a if the if the zero turns are in fine shape, we'll probably kick it a year. 
if we needed to, um, instead of making the purchase right away and then it might allow us to skip. But we are trying to be consistent as much as possible, at least in how we we go through our examination of the, of the equipment and, and decision to move it forward. So um, if it is applied, we, if there are, if there are fewer than four people mowing, then there's always one mower that's sitting there as the backup. So if you have three people mowing and four mowers, then there's always one available in case one breaks down. Do we need to buy it or would you wait until we actually have one break down and then put it forward? Again, I'm trying to think, do we absolutely need it? And the number of articles we have to discuss. Yeah. I mean, like I said, that we have 10,000 sitting there that can purchase a, a zero turn tomorrow if we needed it. And we obviously haven't because we don't at this time, but that's not, it's also because we have that schedule where we, we start looking at things. Um, yeah. You I mean, I know from ARPA and just buy it if it really, if, if you need it. You already had authorization last year to buy it. Right. right. We give a couple of the $2,000 together somewhere, not a problem. All right. I, I, I think would Lynn's suggest right. then that we go ahead and strike this one and yeah, I think Lynn, yeah. on forward. Okay. Yeah. And I did have a conversation with Gary about that concept as well, taking it out before today's meeting. And he said that he doesn't have a preference either way mechanically. So yeah. one down. One down. <laughs> Wave the axe, Lynn. Come on now. <laughs> um, a public works pickup truck. Uh, same thing as the dump truck. I have to get back with Gary about the, the where he is with the numbers. That number is going to come in late only because we, we don't want to get burned like we did last year with the numbers changing drastically and they, they continue to have some flexibility and variability to it. So. And just to point out the numbers don't match. Yeah. That's last okay. year's I put in there a number for. Yeah. We 40,000 up top instead of the 50. Right. It's just, it's just sketching it out until, um, until we go in and make that adjustment. Um, the water storage tank. So this is kind of a, a, a different Warren article. Um, this one authorized uh, $800,000 for term debt uh, and $800,000 in retained earnings to, to purchase the water tank. Um, we, have, we talked about it last uh, Monday night, so we don't have to spend too much time on what it's needed for. But um, from a Warren article perspective, you know there is debt built into it, which is a little bit different than any of the other articles we've looked at in the past. Yeah, and I like Cam's comments to to show what yep. it's increasing from. Definitely. And then um, the water meter, water meter replacement. Um, again, we, we talked, talked about, about that one too. So just because I know we've got about 11 minutes with Marshall yeah. and, you know, 30 more with Cam. Um, yep. Maybe we Me go too. Through and I got a hard stuff. Questions on them as we go. Since we have uh, gone through, no, no, no issues with the language or, or questions on the article at this time. Okay. Uh, Perkins Road Pump Station and Well Rehab. I know we've talked about that as well. This is authorized us to get the money, but we are going to hold back until we get a little further with the regionalization effort before um, spending any of these funds. But there is a need to be able to move quickly on these because they do continue to break down. So, um, yeah. best yeah. case scenario, we don't have to spend the money and we return it in a future warrant. Um, yeah. Worst case, we need to spend it and we spend it. <laughs> it's here for us to do it. Um, and and that's both of those are still water enterprise, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. All three of the water ones are are coming straight from the enterprise funds. Does it say that? Oh yeah, it does. Never mind. Yep. Okay. And then we have the we took the assessor's five year uh, recertification out of the operating budget because it's once in every five years and we're trying to balance the budget. And so that's where we're going to buy free cash to, <laughs> to do the. <laughs> yep. And um, for playground. The, for so. playground one, is there any chance of that coming from ARPA? Again, it I'm could. thinking of getting rid of it, articles. It could. I think the, I think the question is, and this is coming up on a, a future meeting, right? Is to discuss sort of what that, queued items look like because that there's more than there's there's dollars at this point for things that have been identified as potential i mean i think we brought one up just the other night um was a request from the historic society right about right. that and that i think we're hundreds of thousands more of ask than we have funding for arpa so it just becomes a 
Oh, is that okay? I I saw we had like six hundred and fifty thousand left. Um, I didn't actually see what are items to be, you know, proposed. But if, if ARP is really tight, then you know. Right now we have one point. It's called two million dollars uh, of available. We've got one point three committed and approved, and we have um, six hundred and eighty six remaining balance and then the list of potential projects not including the historic society is over is over 1.2 million so we're is that up on the website kevin do we see that no. list of okay no we, why... we're very we're very the committee okay. discussed this and we're we we want to that's okay to I, yeah it's just that that's why i didn't know we were running yep. out of money because i don't know what that list looks like so no but yeah. you, you have a bigger list you know, it's okay. Can I ask one more question? An update on that in, in, in an upcoming meeting. Uh, yeah. That's right. Can I ask, did, did, is this, didn't this warrant appear last year too? Or am I making that up? Or is this like we did, improvement? We did ball the playground field. improvements. We did ball field last year where we spent okay. through six ball fields, uh, three at Pie Brook, two o'clock, and one for the spring over at um, Proctor. And we also did landfill maintenance um, as a oh, large. Okay. I think I think it was the ball fields. Yeah, this is sort of the next step um, was to get the playgrounds. And the next article <laughs> is the um, Clock Park feasibility study, uh, which is something that came directly from members of the TAA, um, who asked us to put a warrant article forward to to do a feasibility study. Um, our team's fine with it. You know, there's no no one on our team says it's a bad idea. Um, we're certainly willing to partner with TAA as often as we can because it's a great organization. And so that's what this one represents as well. And this will allow us to do in the last two years, feasibility study of clock in the grounds, which we've heard a lot of people have concerns about the grass there. It allows us to get our playgrounds safe and allow us to get our ball fields um, up to up to safe playing conditions and up, updated. So, um Kevin, do you mind if we jump ahead just because we've got seven minutes left um, before some members have to leave? Because um, I, I know a number of the next ones are like zoning related. Um, but there's a new one in here for the moderator to bump it up to three years. Can, can you give background on where that one came from? Sure. Um, so the background on that particular article is that the moderator had expressed um, an interest in expanding that out to three years, which is a very, it's consistent with many of our board's commission terms when we people are elected to those positions. Um, and so we said, yeah, let's put it on here for discussion and see if it's something that the select board would like to see on the warrant. Hi, if um, I can speak to it, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I, I was gonna say, I had already put forward my comments, so I'll let others talk. Um, my thought on it, or my understanding, because when this came up, my first question was, well, why was it one year to begin with? And I think it goes back, you know, to the his history of town meeting, where the moderator was actually a elected, you know, morning of, day of, you know, as the meeting began, they'd say, all right, we're going to have this meeting, let's elect a moderator. So a moderator was elected every year. Um, that seems uh, archaic now, given the reality of how we do it. Um, and it, it is, I don't want to use the term unfair because an elected office is an elective office, but it certainly seems inconsistent with pretty much every other, not only elected office, but I think the vast majority of our appointed positions are also three-year terms. Virtually everything we have in town elected or appointed is three years. So to me, it makes sense that this would be the same. You're on mute, Boyd. All right. Marshall, historically, you're absolutely correct. I talked to Steve Whelan about it and, and he, he confirmed what you just uh, reiterated. And I will tell you that he, he thinks it's very cumbersome for the town moderator to have to run and run a campaign every year. Yep. And uh, so those two issues go together uh, to form this article. A couple of thoughts I'll throw in. Um, the, the process generally in town 
um, it's fairly straightforward for running. You pull papers, you get 35 signatures and people vote. It's usually not contested 99% uh, out of the time. The moderator is a little different animal in that it's not a committee, just like, or a board. Like with us, there are five different votes, five different perspectives coming to bear on every decision that's made. In the case of a moderator, you have one person. And I'm not at all saying this directed towards Steve because he's done a great job, but we all know turnover happens and you don't know necessarily who's going to be coming into the position of moderator. So my first point would be, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. It's working well for us. So there's always sometimes unintended consequences with making a change. Second, that position is a single person and it's a very powerful position. That person runs the town meetings. That person decides who they will call on and who they won't call on. They can stop a discussion at any point. They call the vote. So if you needed to get a two thirds vote um, and everybody yells I and then nay, that person is the one who decides whether or not something passes. Um, they can decide whether to stop the meeting and move <coughs> to a second meeting. They run the whole meeting. The other thing that's very powerful is they appoint the entire FinCom. So in a three-year term, the whole uh, flavor of the FinCom could turn over. Um, that's a very powerful position because the FinCom is a very powerful committee. Now, I, I looked around to surrounding towns to see what they were doing. And so there were 13 towns that I looked at with us being one of them. Five of the towns had one year and eight of the towns had three year. But of the ones that had the three year term, half of them had the select board point the FinCom. They did not give that power to the moderator. So if you're really looking at the situation that we're at, a one year term with some control over the appointments of the FinCom, the majority of the towns follow our path. They don't go three year and give the moderator but, full control over the FinCom. It, it just to check the numbers there though, you said eight do three year half the select board. So that means it's five where there's a one year term, four where there's a three year term appointed by select board, and four where there's a three year term appointed by the moderator. So right. I don't, well, I, don't know. I, I draw a slightly different conclusion. Well, I would look at that and say five towns know the strength of a moderator appointing the FinCom and they turn it over every year so that you could have a different person in there adding more conservative or more liberal voices, depending on, you know, what he or she wanted to do. Of the towns that have three year, they took the appointments of the FinCom out of the hands of the moderator. He does not have that power. So he might be in there for three years running the meeting, but he can't appoint the FinCom. So those towns did recognize the significance of the power to appoint the FinCom. So you've got a, a number of towns, the ones that have one year terms that can constrain, you know, appointing the FinCom and four other towns that have put it into the hands of the select board. So I just think it's an awful lot of power concentrated in the hands of one person and we don't have a recall initiative. So if for some reason you got someone in there and they weren't recusing themselves or calling on people or they were um, staffing the FinCom with all one type of voice, there's nothing that you can do for three years. And, and look at the amount of work that they do with every department in the schools to analyze the costs and try to take all perspectives um, you know, into consideration and putting together the budget. So I just think it's uh, it's not a, a path we want to go down. And, and we don't have a problem right now. If we had a real problem that we were trying to solve, but right. we're just saying someone doesn't want to take out papers and get 35 signatures each year. I, so I don't in, see that as a problem. In those, in those comments, um, if when the town moderator appoints FinCom members, how long are FinCom members appointed for? Three. Three years. Three years. So every year right. you're turning over potentially three if people leave. So over the course of three years, everybody could be turned over. When I when I heard that the uh, this thing was being proposed, I was concerned about the fact that it is a powerful position primarily because of the appointment of FinCom. And uh, I was concerned about uh, somebody coming out of the woodwork that you have no clue what their background is in town government or who they are or what they are. 
and uh, and if 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 we stick with it like it is, uh, you're stuck with whoever comes out of the woodwork uh, for three years, and uh, that concerned me from the very start, and I'm still concerned about it. It just reminds me of the adage that the American people elect who they deserve. You know, that's 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 not on the process. That's on the people, either that there's not enough people running or that the people voted for them. My perspective, one year or three years is we we need more people running for these positions. So what what do we think makes it more attractive to run? The, there's the uh, oh, I can try it out for a year and see if I like it or not. Or there's the I'm not going to bother for just one year. What what do we think? What? OK, to, to answer that, Steve has been there for oh, he's been there for a while. I can't remember how long, but it's been a long time. And before right? him, you, Steve Hall years, was there probably. for a long time Ten? and John Kinnan was there for a long time. People, if they're interested in running for that position, they stay, mm. you know, but they and have to let's, go let's back. Let's not to the forget people. who proposed this, though, is Steve. So. Yeah, but he's been there for four years, so. I mean, I, it's as simple as pulling papers and sticking it on Gilly's desk and 35 people sign it. Mm -hmm. It's been uncontested for a number of years. And I agree with you, Raphael, we do want more people to run, but I don't think moving to a three-year term is what's stopping people. They're like, ah, oh, they're not demanding enough of me. I want it three <laughs> years of time, you know? It's hard to get people to step up for even subcommittees. You're all aware that nobody's taken out papers for that position. Yeah, but it's not because it's not three years. Oh, yeah. I, I don't know why. I, I think that people are just, uh, first of all, we get several positions that are still open that people have taken out paper for. So I think it's just a um, almost a uh, uh, a voter um, uh, malaise or uh, maybe they maybe they think we're doing such a great job that they don't need to run. I think people are really busy. I mean, look at us, you know, the five of us trying to get schedules together. It's tough. People are very busy these days. And um, so, yeah, we well, have to do a what I better job of rethinking about. Uh, I would suggest, given our time today and the fact that I have to leave, um, that we we mull this one a little bit more, having heard everyone's comments, and, and we don't move on leaving it or taking it off right now. We get a sense but of the I, I would agree with that. I'd like to talk to Steve Whalen a little bit more about that in terms of why he really thought it was such a great deal to run yep. uh, for this office, because like Lynn said, it's almost always unopposed. And all you yep. got to do is get 35 signatures and you're on the ballot. I would tell you uh, to your question, uh, Lynn, about a sense of the board. My sense coming in was I, I was fully in favor of three years, but I've heard what you have said and what Boyd has said, and I want to think on it. So I actually can't give you a sense of me right now because I'm now really, I want to mull it over. And that's and where I, I would just I, say that, you know, we could always take it up next year. If we're, we're finding, again, this is an issue or a problem. It's not urgent. Um, and I don't want to rush into a big change. And we certainly have enough to go through in town meeting. I have talked to a couple of people about the possibility of them running for moderator. Uh, one said absolutely no, and one is still on the fence. I think okay. so. Um, uh, well, I don't think we want to we want to <laughs> talk about this year's election necessarily, right? In this moment, uh, I'm I'm not going any further than that. I'm just telling okay. you that that's a good point, Mr. Chair. May I know you need to leave? Is there anything else? that you wanted to make sure you, while you were here, we, we touched on? Uh, not in the framework of this meeting right now. No, I'm good. Okay. How, will we, how will we resolve the rest of these articles with people dropping off? What's, what's the plan? The next working session? Maybe we should just stop and go to the next working session. If, if TM, you can only stay for another 15 minutes or so, because you said you had about another 20. Yeah. Um, uh, there, are, there's one I'd like to talk about with the codification, but we need the whole board for that. Um, and Lynn, I didn't see the. Uh, maybe it doesn't have to go to an article, but I didn't see the historic commission's request for ARPA. Would that have to go through here? Or is that directly no, to? Okay, that's just the ARPA. Okay, that's okay. ARPA committee. Okay. 
I mean, if if we're fine ending it now, I'm happy to stay for a, a motion to adjourn. Well, you, I, I don't know. The other one, I guess we could talk about later, though, that that really piques my interest again is the turf fields. So yeah. The, the, one one thing, just from a timeline standpoint for everyone, uh, my hope today was to get through so I can get a version three out. Um, I know the FinCom is going to start discussing it on Monday. And so um, just from a, it built, this always happens every year. It's like boom, boom, boom. The order of operations is really quick. Um, I, I know we received everyone's feedback. The, again, the intent of today was to kind of flush out people's feedback on particular items. Um, and we've already eliminated one article, which is good. Um, is it, would it be possible to try to get through in the next 15 so minutes, maybe to the end? And we could probably skip the zoning because that's coming from an outside source for today's purposes. I'll leave that as presented from KP. And I know, Madam Vice Chair, that the planning board has reviewed um, and yourself as well, and that the language is in a decent place. And that, that would be sort yeah, of a sub one change, but it's it's editing. Yeah, yeah that would be good. Is, is that okay with the board? I, I know, Mr. Chair, you do need to leave, but it would. I do need to leave, but I'm content to let you all take it all from here or adjourn either way. Um, Marshall, if we decide not to keep something on here, are you okay with that or you want yep, to? Yep, I'm end? comfortable. I am just 20% of this group. So I am. Uh, there is nothing that, that I feel all that strongly about uh, that is left to discuss. Okay. All right. Well, we have, we have to leave when Cam leaves anyway, don't we? Uh, I've got a 1230 hard stop as well. So, so let's, um, if it's okay. I'll, we'll commit, to, to, I'll commit to 1230 right. so we have a quorum for a while. Okay. Just yeah, hang on. Well, Cam had to leave. We do have a quorum, Raphael, but I just yeah. feel more comfortable having everybody kind of wait. More efficient. In. It's more efficient that way, totally. So okay. what I'm gonna do is I'm marking on this article on this version, article 26, through the zoning articles, 26, 27 is the lease and the option, and then the, it goes into the home rule petition for the liquor license. And then zoning. I think we've discussed those at yeah. length. I don't think we need to spend any more time right now, unless the board would like to. Um, but I, I was, uh, Mr. Brown, I was just saying, I left us Sorry. off at uh, 26. That's the downtown yep. lease. Article 27 yeah. is the option to purchase. And the yep. home rule petition is 28. After that, to where we picked up is the um, uh, the the zoning changes. That have been presented by the uh, zone uh, by the planning board. Um, Kevin, the the Thanks. document I think it was for the lease um, under administrative. I can't get in. It says no access or okay. That, there's a problem, so I can't see that document. I don't know if anyone else had trouble reading that document. What, what, the uh, if the you look on the board docs agenda under um, warrants, there's something under administrative online. Oh, uh, I don't even see that. I don't have anything administrative online. What I think well, I might, might not be logged in. Sorry. <laughs> 26, 27. This is the detail of 26, 27. It was, I think, 26. Was it the lease, Kevin? Both. Lease yeah, down. I put it in yeah. subcategory because okay. we're still in negotiations. I put in yeah. those, the language for those. Yeah. So it's not visible. It's not pulling up. There's all kinds of words there. I'll make, I'll make sure you get a copy, um, maybe outside this conversation, if that's all right. Great. And 28, just so everyone knows, that home rule petition is not for liquor licenses for manufacturing of alcohol. That was an early discussion, and um, KP understands it's for the ability to provide an all poor liquor license for taverns. And Kevin, I would think that would come after Article 29 and 31 being approved. I, I think it also has to be for. I think it has to have to do with manufacturing of the alcohol on site for the and yeah, but just for the for the license as well. It, it, I think they're state and federal. I, I but check with them. I, I didn't yeah. think that we needed to do anything. They had to get state and license um, state and federal approvals. Um, so what but, what I'll do is um, I talked to Matt last night about that article, Madam Vice Chair, okay. and the and basically said you know you and I had a couple of conversations about is it a new one? Is it a um, is it, is it two new licenses or is it just adding uses with it? He was kind of in the position I am. Not a really hard and fast one or the other. It's really our, our discretion of which direction. I think we're both, based on our conversation, I'm fine with it as you just articulated that it being an additional use built into the existing licenses. I think the question Matt was looking, or what Matt was then going to look into, this is like six o'clock last night when we spoke, 
is he was going to just kind of fine tune exactly what that looks like to make sure it meets our expectation for what we're hoping to achieve through it, which is a distillery or a brewery or something like that could be available to somebody to come into town and, and, and have that. Yeah. So just for the other board members right now, we have the ability to provide an all four license for conference and event centers and for restaurants. We are, we would add taverns because a tavern is a different animal per the state definition than a restaurant. So. And, and is it, is it, ta is it, so the tavern has a legal definition and I assume like pub, bar, yes, blah, blah, all those things that we use colloquially fit in there. Yeah. You can look at it in the, the article it's written in <clears throat> what a tavern is. So it's more the difference served at tables or a counter. It's a fine line, but the, the state does have a different definition for it. So. Well, the with or without food is a really big part of it, though. That's that's a big part of the definition. So you, you well, can't... It, the without is taken out. Right, so it, right. With that's food, what I'm saying. You, yeah. you can't sit at a bar and, you know, have drinks without having food accompany it. And that's our call. The state does allow you to do a tavern without food. You could have, like, just popcorn that they bought next door at Layla's, you know. But we were proposing, the planning board was proposing, uh, not that. We don't want a bar where people just go in, it's dingy, and you have popcorn, and you just sit and drink. We wanted it to have a common VIX license and to have some level of food, onion so rings, it, um, something it, like I remember I during COVID, there were big challenges yeah. about what to find food during this. You know, just putting a hot dog thing there didn't do it. There was it, it was it was tight. I remember that. And I think right. the, and a common VIC license is what defines kind of the is. level of food preparation. <clears throat> I think the, the only concern I have is that many breweries do not have common VIC licenses. Um, so right. that's not under the pub brewery definition. Pub brewery has a different definition than tavern. Right, which is what we've always, what the ask was initially was so that we could have the brewery component of it and like a tasting room or something like that. If that, if that's what's mm -hmm. designed in that particular space that we've that spurred the conversation. And that's in there. That's one point eight seven. Kevin, the Kevin, pub brewery. This, Kevin, this is wrapped up with your brew pub concept, is it not? It allows us more flexibility because we heard during our last, our first round of um, RFP on the garage that that multiple people said their first inclination is to put a, a, a little brewery in there with tap room. No, no food necessarily. Like they'll bring food trucks. Like Old Planners in Beverly is a great example. There's no kitchen, but they bring a food truck in every Friday, Saturday night. It sits right in front of the, the building. People get their beer and they walk, well, they get their food and they walk to the, you know, five feet over to the sitting area and they have, their nachos with their beer, but there's a financial component to having the common VIX with the equipment you have to invest in. And I think it, it could be a limiting factor if the uses prevent it. But I did hear somebody say that there, that that's that beyond just the tavern, there is language that's being proposed by KP. I haven't had a chance to look at it explicitly to be honest, to be completely frank around the, um, one okay, point just to be clear, the pub brewery definition is completely separate and it doesn't have a, a common VIC requirement. Then but there's that, the tavern definition and that has the common VIC. So we're And then there's point. beverage manufacturing, which has no food requirement whatsoever. No food. But, they they just, still, but they can still sell it, says, right? Yes, they can make and it so, and sell it. So we're good. So that's a bar with no um, food. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, for, well, no, it says for retail Samples. sale, for consumption on or off the premise, which may, um, it, it's more like a, um, a tasting, like uh, the privateer rum over in Ipswich, where they have a um, little bar there and they make all their specialty rums in the back and they sell them. Mm -hmm. so you can also have them right there to taste them. Uh, you can consume them at that little bar. So you take a look at the language and see if it's not doing what you need it to do, you know, and give well, comments, we can address that as a separate because it's kind of a big animal. Because I think the other question is, do we want, or have we had this conversation, a brewery or whatever you want to call it, somebody who's making beer to be able to just sell just beer without that food? The planning board's take was no. They, they don't want this people coming in and at a bar and sitting down and drinking. Uh, but, you know, we can talk about it later because I know yep. Kevin is saying the pub brewery concept kind of is that, but it's it's not a dingy bar. Right. It's it's something that's more, you know. Lynn, I don't think 
dingy and beer have to go hand in hand. Like, I, I don't think we have to imply that just because you're not eating, it's a, you know, it, it's dark. I hear what you're saying and I hear what the planning board's saying, but I think part of the attraction for people from out of the neighborhood as well as our neighborhood is not being forced to eat, but to go in and say, hey, we just played golf and we're going to take an hour to meet here before we go home or whatever. I I don't love the idea of it being tied to a quid pro quo of food. Well, and that there's a public hearing, Cam. It's not set in stone at all. March okay. 7th, it's opened up to the entire town okay. to weigh in on this and, yep. and let the, the leadership and the planning board know what is it they're looking for. Cool. So that's okay. scheduled in about a week. Yeah. Is it... Um, I, I think back to the days when we were arguing about the very first uh, license to be able to sell beer and wine in town. And that was a long, lengthy, ugly discussion. And here we are talking about meeting. Now we're talking about making beer in town. And that's a huge step. <laughs> progress. It's, it's progress. Point. Yeah. At the, at the seventh meeting for like Kevin, you get up and explain what you envision for a brew pub and why you say with or without food or whatever. Let people hear because people have their own preconceptions about what a bar would be moving into town. And so that's the opportunity to share with everybody what everyone's thinking. Yeah. And I would, I wouldn't want to run ahead of the select board either. Right. Like if, if, you know, this, we talked about economic development being our primary goal. We got great feedback from our first RFP on the garage. And I, I just, you know, the whole purpose of, of these articles, the ones that touch the downtown specifically is to try to open up these types of opportunities. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to sit, I would speak to it, but only if the board is behind me or with me on it. Right. So um, you know, I've shared my vision for the space with everybody. I think that, you know, the more, you know, there's, there's some really great communities that have done some really, really great things, um, that are, you know, it's not, I think as Mr. Brown said, it's not a smoke full, dark, smoke filled dark room where, you know, it's, it's, it, <laughs> you can do some really great things if you create those opportunities for people to make the investment in the way that they have a vision. Um, and with the garage specifically, you know, we can control our destiny and saying, no, nope, that's not the vision for that space. No, nope, that, right. That, well, that privateer rum does not have food. That is just a, a space where you get drinks and behind it, you see all the barrels and then making that's, all the liquor. That, that's what I it's like. I, I think, think the, the winery. I think the winery up on Route One is the same way. You can go in here and get a glass yeah. of wine, but I don't know if they sell food. No, they and, don't. And, they, they put food out on their special nights, but that's like they kind of like bring your own. I don't know how to get away with it, but they, that's what they're doing. And, they're <laughs> and, and I think the difference is like a sample of rum is a full serving of rum. A sample of beer is not a pint of beer. <laughs> and right but now I, it says sample, so. Maybe Madam Vice Chair, maybe maybe you and I can have, a, we're going to talk about a couple other items offline. Maybe that's something we can kind of, I'd want to dig in what the intention of the planning board is relative to what the request from has was and what exactly is in here and what the intentions from everybody are and just make sure those are all aligned. Um, sure. And I would really think, Kevin, maybe touch base with the select board, but I think it would be important for you to share what your vision is at that public um, meeting, because I don't think the planning board is going to be able to share what your vision is. So yeah. if you want the town to hear what you think those establishments could be, it'd probably be a good idea to be there. I, it, it, I'd want to make sure though that everybody's aligned here. Um, and yeah. I think we are, I mean, we've had these conversations for, for years now <laughs> and um, we've, we've built up and kept building and creating the path to help us get to where we are right now. And so, I just want to make sure, I mean, maybe I can, we can have offline conversation just, or maybe I would love, prefer online, but time's a premium, right? So. Um, well, we could do it in another work session because I think the whole voice of the board is important to hear. But the meeting's on the 7th, correct? Um, yep. And we don't meet until the 8th. Well, you're not speaking for the board, just saying what you envision. Uh. I have no problem speaking to it. Let me put it that way because I know it's the right thing to do. And I know- Do I know you guys have a problem with Kevin sharing what his vision was for the highway garage? I don't have a problem with it. No, absolutely not. Nope. Well, we can talk offline, Kevin, and see, but I, yeah, I think- No, I, 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 I will do whatever the board would like. I, I, I do think there's huge, huge value if it's all of us speaking to it. I can be the voice, but having that, 
if it's a letter of support for it or if there's some sort of communication. We can talk offline. Yeah, I just well, want to get Kevin, don't put yourself in a compromising position. If you don't feel comfortable with doing that, then we'll figure out another way to do it. I don't, I, I, I believe in this in my soul. Like I, I know we're making such great progress. Like I was at a meeting today with a number of town administrators and police chiefs and they were all saying, they're hearing good things about what we're working on. Like we're doing it and I believe it. We've got to, you know, we're engaging with the Newburyport Chamber of Commerce. It's great, great, great things. And I can speak to it, no problem. And it sounds like you all support this, which is fantastic. My bigger overarching concern that I, I didn't want to get right to this because it's a personal issue. My wife's due on the 7th. Although she could go into labor in an hour. <laughs> I just, my, well, there's my, a priority. <laughs> so if my I'm personal kidding. opinion, I'm, I'm willing to go. I'm willing to go with this idea with, with or without food. Yeah. I just want to make sure we have a game plan because the date's coming up and I, and I want to make sure if there's certain limitations, we understand what those are. And I think it makes it, sense. I think we have to have one more quick call on this one more heads coming together on this if if we're going to put this on um and and if we have to get an alt for you kevin we have to have a game plan for that as well in the event you know you've got the new one coming so you know we can we have no get together schedule between now and the seventh right no, our next meeting's not well we have monday but um can we do this online so that we can get through one or two more of these articles or is that not possible I mean, we could, we could put, I don't know if the agenda has been posted, but it's not too late to add. We could put this on as an agenda item at the select board and regular meeting. I don't think it's the right, necessarily the right place to have that. I don't think so either. It's just going to bring up more questions. If any participants want to, you know, town constituents want to come in. Do we want to try to schedule another meeting then between now and Friday? And I, again, I might be in and out. I don't know. All right. Slowly. I'm, I'm, a, I'm actually leaving tomorrow morning early for a couple of days and I will have no access. Let me do this. I, I, email will work. Yeah, I'll email or call everyone and just kind of, kind of. Let's, I'll review this. Maybe Madam Vice Chair, you and I can have a quick conversation at when this concludes, and just or, or or find some time later today to just sit down and kind of go through it together. And then from sure. there, and hey. then from there, we can just have sort of an understanding of what it is, and I can sort of get a sense of um, game planning of uh, for prep for the Tuesday. And just yeah, we'll go for my only concern is if the the, the um, public meeting goes forward and people don't have a view of like I keep using privateer rum. It's a really cute place. And it's got like a, a canoe a kind of shaped bar and you can see the barrels in the back. There's no food there. And to Cam's point, it's not dingy. It's all windows and open and it, it's cool. If that image is not presented on the 7th. Everybody there will just have their own image of what a bar is. And that's the feedback that will go to the planning board. And that's the only opportunity for the town to give their feedback. So we want to make sure that all the different ideas are presented. So right. the feedback, you know, um, is based upon, you know, what we've discussed and not just the idea of a, a neighborhood bar in some town where people go in at 11, start drinking and, you know, yeah, well, I want them to have the right idea. Yeah, and I, this is a critical moment because we, if we miss the mark on this, it could set us back another year on the whole, on the um, on the building. And that's we've got three Raquel, and a half. Uh, I'm sorry, Raquel, are you okay without food? I mean, do you feel like there are some options that would be perfectly fine for a bar with no food? Oh, absolutely. I'd actually fa favor more leverage or more flexibility towards that side. Okay, so I think you have the the consensus of the board, Kevin, as to what they're thinking. So I'm not sure we all need to get together. We just have to make the wording such that it doesn't require food. Okay. So and, and with we, or without. do we present or will the, will the planning board, like how do, where, should we make the modifications and send it back to Martha, do you think, or is this something that. Yeah, Martha... let's talk offline. I can call okay. Martha and let her know that the, the select board is feeling the with or without foods. The, when the we wrap to... in like five minutes, maybe you and I, Lynn, can just get on the get on the horn, and then we can go from there and talk. You oh. can have that conversation. Okay, perfect. Um, all right. So if we skip up to article, um, can I ask this, Kevin? If yeah. because everyone's had a chance to look at the articles, does anyone have any concerns about any of the articles, or you need more information, or you'd like to make changes? Well, article I completely. 30. You mean, Lynn? You mean the zoning article? No, any of the articles in the warrant. We've had it for a week. Everyone yeah. submitted edits. 
um, we've got five minutes to go. And instead of walking through and describing each one, because we've already gone through them all, yeah. does anyone have any comments or concerns about what is in here remaining? I, I share Raphael's concern with the turf field. The turf field. Okay, so that's one to be discussed. The turf. Okay. So uh, just a real a yeah. turf field. I know that was one, um, Mr. Chair, uh, the Chair Hook wanted to talk about. Real quick, all three communities, Masco, uh, Middleton, Foxford, and Topsfield, have had conversations with the chairs and the town administrators. We've expressed this, and I'm having a further conversation later uh, tomorrow with the administration at that Masconomic that they there's two revenues for the turf fields. One, Masco builds it into their their they at, they issue a debt authorization on the fields. It's a roundabout way to force the hand if they get enough votes at the school committee to put it in, and the town doesn't get a sense to vote. All three towns, myself and the other two town administrators and, and select board chairs have met. We are all adamant that this should be a separate free cash allocation, put a light on it and let the townspeople vote on it and have a say. And so that's the essence of this. The turf field is going to be some way coming forward for Masco, and we're basically forcing the transparency around it by putting them on as free cash allocations. So I just wanted to make sure I frame that so everyone understood where we're at. Those conversations literally happened on Monday with the three communities, and that's we're all aligned at this point. For me, that's a really important clarification, and I feel 100% better now that you said that. Great. Um, I'm I'm against it, but that's neither here nor there. I, um, I, I agree, especially once those dollar, 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 dollar. One point. In. Yeah, you got it. Well, the, the other question, too, that should be brought up is they put together a capital plan. It was like a 10 year capital plan or 20 year. And they identified what needed to be done in the first year, five years, 10 years, et cetera. Was this ever in there? Has this risen up to be a much more important capital item than anything else that's on their capital plan? So uh, this is not said by anybody directly to me, but my understanding is that there has been a group of masconomic stakeholders, parents, who have been advocating for improved ball fields and playing fields, and that they have been pushing this item as something that they wanted to see come forward with the school committee, and that the school committee has received and the administration has received and has acknowledged to put it up for discussion purposes, if nothing else. I don't know how the administration, because I haven't had that direct conversation until tomorrow, how they truly feel about it, but I know that they've brought it forward and that it's been generated from people involved with the schools, but not necessarily from the administration themselves. Okay, I think it's I a think pretty, sorry. Go ahead, Kim. Nope, nope, nope. I was just going to say, I think it's important to frame it in this bigger picture. This is one of many capital items that the school previously said Bingo. were very important to the infrastructure and maintenance of the school. And suddenly this one comes out of left field, no pun intended, um, and it's <laughs> rising to the top above all the others that they've identified as a group, as a leadership team, and as a school committee. And as they're asking for 1.5, whatever, whatever, you know, whatever the number is collectively, I can't imagine a worse way walking in to ask for money for something than with a prop two and a half override first. I, I, I would never pitch it in this direction, but you know, whatever. Present it. I agree. I agree. It. And I'm not in, I'm not, I'm not really in favor of turf fields anyway. Be speaking to this, Kevin. The parents who are putting probably, it forward? Probably the administration. They felt comfortable enough to bring it forward. Technically, it's it's from them. The administration's asked for this to be part of their, their budget. We, the administrators, said they're it's built in under debt in their initial budget proposal. We said, no, we're paying through free cash, which basically pulls it out of their assessment and makes it a separate item so that there's, like I said, a light on it, there's transparency, and the community can vote if it's something they want to invest in. And that's where we need to understand sort of there's me there's multiple mechanisms of how we it can get presented. But um, at the end of the day, I think from a presenting presentation standpoint, FinCom will speak to it if they recommend action or not. And then the community and the schools will have an opportunity to speak to it at the microphone at town meeting. Okay. Any other thoughts or comments on that one? I think it's in the right place. Just the, the other background information. They had no 
uh, estimates on how much it would take basically to get the current fields up to um, playable because the, the current fields are terrible. That's what they're trying to solve, but they did not know the cost of the alternative, which is grass and water. Um, Madam Vice Chair, if I could just, I know we're running out of time, but I did want to just speak to the Article 39, which is the one prior to that. And at this point, we've basically got most of the, the, the articles with changing in there besides the revolving account. Um, this item, this is an article that allows us to, we did a codification of our existing bylaws two years ago. Um, it's up on the website now, which is great. Um, it's consistent numbering everything. This item here is to hire a consultant to look at our actual bylaws and basically tell us if there's any overarching changes we need to make antiquated information, um, things that aren't included that need to be included and working with our department heads to find that information. So we've got a quote from um, KP on what it would cost. That's what the number that's built into it. But this is, I liken it to a master plan. Every handful of years, 10, 15 years, you should be looking at how you're doing and then reassess and make modifications. Now our bylaws haven't had this done. I don't know when last time there was a comprehensive review of all the bylaws, but I do know that this is something that's um, my department heads feel very strongly about because they've read their bylaws that relative to their departments and like this isn't aligned with how state law is or this isn't aligned with how we operate. And so we've got a really good working group right now or steering committee because um, I'm referring to made up of department heads, Beth Willis running sort of point with, with Chief Hubby on it. And um, the idea is the, the consultant to help us basically take our bylaws and, and make them up to speed, up to date um, and, and, and have those right. Um, Kevin, I understand the need to do it 100%. It seems like an, ex and I said this to you the other night, it just feels to me to be a big budget item for reviewing laws and someone who knows mass law at the back of their hand, just being able to make some appropriate changes. I mean, is there room in here to decrease that number? Yeah. No, I think you said it actually had risen. Yeah. So we, the initial, so initially we were estimated 10 to 15, then it went to 15 to 20 based on a further conversation on what depth we wanted to dive into it. Um, I think it's likely to be close to the 15. I mean, it's our initial pricing for salary survey was 10 or nine grand. I mean, it's the cost for the consultant work is, is expensive. Um, and then with a comprehensive look at this, I think it's the number does, it does feel strong, uh, but it doesn't necessarily feel like it's after kind of looking at what the scope would actually be like it, it's wrong. I think it's it's a good safe number though. I can't see us getting any. We wouldn't get past that twenty. That, that would not. I can't see us getting past that. But I'm hoping to be closer to the fifteen range to be to be to be direct. And a lot of it will come down depending on how much work the, the <laughs> town can, can put towards it to help take some of that burden off the consultant from doing some of that work. So we would work. We, department heads on their time would basically be helping the consultant, and by doing that, bring that oh, cost down. I have a couple of concerns with this one, Kevin. Uh, um, first, the first codification that we did, uh, I'm uh, not really sure what we got out of it. Um, the numbering scheme is really strange. There's huge gaps between the numbers. Um, there was a lot of things that were wrong in the data that weren't corrected. So it didn't look like they were looking for content. Um, and I if it was a renumbering, the, the numbering is very hard to follow right now. So I'd, I'd want to see if this is the same approach that we used the last time. And the other is that we're gonna hire a consultant to come in and go to each department head and the departments are the ones who know whether uh, um, something is outdated. It's similar to when I went into the bylaws and I saw that there were no longer highway and water and park uh, commissioners or superintendents, uh, commissioners. Um, I had to know that. A consultant coming in from outside is not going to know what changed in the departments. So the bulk of the work is going to be on the department heads themselves to say, these are the things that need to leave. These are the things that need to be amended. And then the consultant's gonna put them together in one package. And then that's gonna get sent over to KP to make sure the, the words are legal, et cetera. And maybe to do that final check if for some reason a state law has changed that is a problem for us. I don't know of how many state laws and federal laws are conflicting with what we have in our bylaws right now. From what I've seen, it's errors on our part that we just didn't get the updates done. Um, we didn't put in changes from votes that were made. 
So, you know, to, to ask people to pay $20,000 out of the tax receipts to correct the problems that we've made, and then to have our own department heads do the bulk of the work, I would see maybe putting in, you know, $5,000 for KP to review the language once we have an internal document that says these things should come out and, and these are the couple of changes to be made. I, I, don't, I don't see the value in bringing in a consultant to do that, but so, we're going to be doing the work. So KP's, KP is our consultant. They're the ones who will do the work because they know it. That's going to streamline a lot of the process and potentially the cost. We need a centralized... Well, the wording I, in here says engage town council or a consultant. Reality is we'll probably go with KP because the overall cost will be less. And they're and very get, pricey. They're very pricey. And they're not going to know what's changed in the department. The department's going to have to modify so, and identify. Excuse me. It's me. Cool. I got to hop. I got to hop, guys. Thank you. Okay. So we'll carry this over for further discussion because we'll have to... So we'll the, have to leave now. Yeah, no, the, we don't the, have a forum. We're going to have to beg off, Kevin, because we don't have a forum. We can finish this piece without voting anything. We can discuss without vote. I don't think we can discuss without... A, um, can we? Can we continue to discuss? I'm not sure that we can. Interesting Besides, question. You're going to have to repeat whatever you're saying to everybody. So it's probably not going to be worthwhile. Why don't we were, let's get on the line about the other stuff and we'll talk at that point. That'd be great. Okay. Okay. Um, Boyd, can I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. All right. I second that. And uh, we'll go for roll call. Boyd? Aye. And I say aye. <laughs> we are adjourned. Thank you, everyone, for staying on. And Kevin, do you have time right now? I can give you.